So we, we reached the great result that after two centuries of energy transition, Britain, which is, of course, the, the leading countries of energy transition, the first uh, industrialized country and the first country uh, getting out of uh, fossil fuels, I mean, they pretend, actually, um, Britain used four times more wood to produce their energy now than in the 18th century. And, and just to produce 1.5% of their energy. Welcome back to Decouple. Today I'm joined by Jean-Baptiste Frézeau. Jean-Baptiste is a French historian of science, technology, and the environment. Uh, I believe the correct term is a historiographer of energy um, and the author of several books, uh, but the one we're here to discuss today is uh, in, en français, uh, Sans Transition, Nouvelle Histoire d'Energie. Um, with the provocative subtitle, The Energy Transition Will Not Happen. Uh, and uh, in English, more and more and more. Uh, Jean-Baptiste, uh, welcome. Thank you so much for making the time to come on Decouple. Thank you. So to me, this is a, a really fascinating book. I've been um, deep diving energy now, not as an academic, but uh, as a podcaster for some five years now. Um, you know, pretty up to date in the, uh, you know, English language histories, uh, Buckleaf Smeal, Richard Rhodes and others. Um, and I encountered some pretty, uh, pretty novel ideas uh, in your book, which I'm excited to, to pour into. You know, in this era of AI, of incredible translation of the internet, I was really surprised that there's this almost like linguistic firewall around your ideas. Um, we're about to bust through that on this program, and, and the book is out now. Um, again, I mentioned the provocative title in French. Uh, maybe just to start, I, I was curious, um, you know, this is such a sacred cow, um, perhaps a collective delusion, this idea of, of energy transition, of net zero. I'm just wondering, you know, in terms of the English translation, was it too spicy to, uh, to say, uh, you know, without transition or it's, it's not possible? Uh, basically, the, um, there was a banner called uh, in French, la transition n'aura pas lieu, the transition will not happen. It's the, the publisher who wanted to have uh, this, uh, I mean, powerful words on the, on the cover. Uh, I wanted a more academic uh, title because I think the book is primarily history, even if I think history has something to tell about uh, what is going to happen in the next 20 or 30 years. Um, I mean, I was happy with the, the English title, more and more and more, an all-consuming history of energy. This is perfect, I mean, because uh, indeed the book tries to break this uh, narrative which is so present, even among the very good authors that you mentioned, like Vaclav Smil, Richard Rhodes, you know, they have this narrative of several transitions happening in the past, several energy transitions. And my main point is about the history. You know, we, we cannot really have any history of transition when, when you talk about the past of energy. I think it's a very wrong way to, to, to frame the history. Um, so, I mean, for, 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 the, for the English audience, I think the book is really an up-to-date um, contribution to the field of history of energy, first and foremost. And then the conclusion is about, you know, what does it mean for, for the present days? But really, I want to emphasize the fact that uh, it's primarily a history book. Yeah, yeah. No, and it's, it's interesting, you know, I, I've, you know, both been, uh, uh, you know, studying this space. I've also been an advocate within it um, and discovering that I am an advocate or have been an advocate in the tradition of, of others. So really, really useful. We stand on the shoulders of giants um, to understand, uh, you know, the, the legacy of, uh, from which we, we come. Um, but, you know, this this concept um, of energy transition, it is it's it's all over the, the discourse. I think you track in your book, um, you know, with Google searches, you know, how often it is used. It is assumed to be uh, a truism. It's assumed to have a historic basis. Maybe uh, a good place to start is uh, interrogating this term. Um, you know, I think Smeal and others will say, you know, there are energy additions, and that, that's definitely mm -hmm. part of the, the discourse in the Anglosphere. But I think, you know, your novel contribution is really energy symbiosis as a, as a better model to understand um, humanity's harnessing of, of different energy forms. So um, I'm eager to, to deep dive um, this concept. And uh, I mean, it's a, it's a big chunk of your book. I think it really deserves to be. Um, but uh, I'll let you sort of take it where it's going to go. And definitely, I'm going to be uh, asking a few questions along the way. Okay. So basically, when you take the history of energy, most of the time, what has interested historians is the competition between energy sources. 
I mean, it's really the core topic of many, so many books in history of energy. It's how uh, coal has displaced uh, wood in the 18th and 19th centuries Britain, or how oil has displayed uh, has displaced uh, uh, coal. But in fact, focusing on competition between energy is just telling a small part of the story. In many respects, energy are helping each other. They are in symbiosis. Um, I, I give you like a very famous example. If you take the Industrial Revolution, uh, it is always told as a story of energy transition. Um, and that's why sometimes even in the political uh, uh, sphere, uh, you've got people saying that what we have to do is a new industrial revolution. Uh, John Kerry, you know, the, the U.S. Uh, envoy on climate issues, is following the topic of climate change since the late 1970s. So he should know about that, you know, he's, he should know his history, I think. Um, it's what he said recently. I mean, what we have to do is just another a new industrial revolution. But behind this idea of new industrial revolution, you've got an understanding of the industrial revolution as a transition from traditional energies to coal, basically. And even this is completely wrong. I mean, first of all, traditional energies do expand during the 19th century. I mean, basically, industrial countries burn more wood in 1900 than they did in the 18, early 1800s. And moreover, to extract coal, uh, you need an enormous amount of timber. Uh, for instance, if you take the case of Britain, Britain in the early 20th century used 4.5 million cubic meters of pit props. Uh, and to give you a point of comparison, Britain burned 3.6 million cubic meters of firewood in the 18th century. So just to produce energy, Britain used much more wood in the form of pit props than it did uh, in the form of fuel wood in the 18th century. So that's why we, we really have to uh, forget the story of, you know, uh, coal substituting to, to wood. Uh, it doesn't work like this at all. And, and it is even worse than that, because, of course, to, to produce timber, you need a much larger area of forest. So it means that Britain used four, six, seven times more forests in the 19th, in the 20th century, sorry, than, in, than it did in the, in the 18th century. So you cannot tell a story of energy transition or an escape from an organic economy. That's another you know, topic that you find very often in the historiography of the, of the Industrial Revolution, uh, but it doesn't work at all, really. So uh, another symbiosis uh, between coal and wood, obviously, we had the age of steam, we had locomotives, and I think people don't appreciate um, the amount of wood that was underneath the, the rails, the, the so-called sleepers. Um, so maybe you could, you could go on that a little bit. And then even creosote, like there's just, there's so many examples of how these energy forms and, and raw materials are, are working with each other. So maybe, maybe expand on that a little bit. Yeah. I mean, the, basically the case of coal mine, depending on, on timber is just one example of that. All these, you know, technical systems that are emblematic of the industrial revolution that depended just as much on iron, coal, and they were also depending on timber. Uh, and the, 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 the railroad is a very good example. If you take the case of the United States, late 19th century, they used more than 20 million cubic meters of uh, railway ties, of uh, sleepers. Um, and that's an enormous amount of wood. It's like 10% of the US production of wood. It's uh, several times more than the whole production of forests, of French forests, for instance. Uh, and, and I mean, the Basically, the, the consumption of timber by, uh, by U.S. railway company was uh, more expensive than buying locomotive, for instance. You know, it's, it's really a serious, serious issue. Um, and Creosot is, I think, a, an interesting example of a kind of forgotten technology which had tremendous impact. Uh, Creosot is a, a substance derived from coal, from the distillation of coal. And you can impregnate uh, timber with creosote, and that makes uh, the timber last much, much longer. And that's how coal, in a way, uh, protected the forest from the effect of coal, which were terrible, because all, all these coal technologies did consume more and more wood. And, and conservationists in the U.S. were appalled by the enormous consumption of timber by the railways, by the paper industry, by the packaging, by the mines, 
and they're really worried about that. They were much more worried by the uh, exhaustion of forest than by the exhaustion of coal, because they, they knew very well that coal was just immensely abundant, whereas forests are not that large. And Closot is one of the many technologies that help to protect forests from the uh, bad effects of of coal technology. But, but that's that's interesting because uh, I think within Richard Rowe's work, for instance, um, we have the story that coal saved the forests uh, in, mm -hmm. in England. And so uh, you, we're actually increasing uh, lumber production significantly. Um, and of course, this is within a globalizing world. Um, so to what degree is are the forests being saved by just imports from <laughs> my country, Canada, or, or from Siberia, for instance? Okay. Um... I mean, the, the very large import of timber they were on the an Atlantic, I mean, across the Atlantic, it's really a 20th century story. Um, if you take the case of Britain, which was the biggest uh, timber importer in the 19th century, most of the timber came from the Baltic um, or from the, um, uh, the land plantation in Western France, kind of not very well-known story, but half of the pit props beginning of the 20th century came from one very large uh, pine plantation, uh, which which was launched in the 1860s. And at the end of the 19th century, the, the, the trees were uh, big enough to be used for pit props in, in Britain. So it is this kind of uh, symbiosis, kind of uh, combination of materials that make industrialization. It's not coal uh, substituting uh, to wood. It's really this uh, this uh, entanglement of coal and wood which makes uh, industrial modernity possible. And for instance, in most of the books, you read you have the, the idea that coal is a national resource, you know, but in fact, coal completely depends on uh, an international commerce of timber. I mean, and and the, and, the, and for Britain, it was particularly clear that without all the timber from the Baltic, from Portugal, from France, they cannot have access to, 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 their, to their coal. And it's a, it's a crucial issue during the First World War, during the Second World War. It is a, really a very strategic resource. So, I mean, you cannot have a history of the 20th century without timber. It doesn't work at all. So we're going to move on, I guess, through these um, mythological transitions um, to coal and to, from coal to oil. Um, but I'm, I'm, we're going to keep um, forestry in the background because it, it continues to be relevant. Um, so tell me uh, how, how coal and oil symbiose uh, as, as, it's, as it's added. I think it's more, it's more obvious than the, than the pit props. Um, all the infrastructure of oil from extraction to consumption is based on steel, and steel is completely dependent on coal. I mean, you need coal to have steel. So basically, the, the expansion of the of the oil infrastructure makes that uh, the steel industry is growing, and therefore the coal mines are stimulated by the by by the consumption of oil. I mean, just to give you an example, to build a car in the 1930s, uh, Ford needs seven tons of coal, which in terms of weight is more than the oil that the car is going to burn across its lifetime. So, I mean, if you look at a car in the 1930s, it's just as much coal as oil, you know. Um, and there are calculations which are made uh, on this particular topic. For the case of Britain, it is estimated in the interwar period that for each uh, ton of oil that was burned, 2.5 tons of coal were needed to build infrastructure, the, the cars, uh, the tankers, the, pipe, the pipes, all these uh, needs an enormous amount of coal. So, of course, you cannot tell the story of the 20th century as a transition from oil to coal. I mean, it doesn't work at all. Um, there are other, uh, I mean, to, so, so basically what I, what I try to argue is that instead of having a story of transition, we, we, have, we have a story of um, a, a symbiotic expansion of energies. Um, an, an example of that is the fact that if you take the uh, oil industry in, in the U.S. in the 21st century, it consumes more steel than the whole U.S. economy in the 1900s, in the early 1900s, just the oil industry, because there are so many pipes. Uh, there are pipes everywhere. And we're talking about millions of tons of pipes, you know. Uh, and of course, this steel for oil is expanding because oil is more difficult to get. 
you need to drill deeper. Uh, the oil is uh, has more sulfur, so it corrodes more all the infrastructure, which is made of steel. Uh, the, the pipelines, of course, are, are, are much, much uh, bigger, larger, longer. Uh, so, I mean, yeah, the... Uh, this is completely obvious when you look at the the, the writing of the engineer that uh, oil is not going to displace coal. I mean, it's a, there, there is a displacement of uh, of coal by oil just for a very short period of time between I would say 1959 to uh, the oil shock of 1973, and is mainly for the electric sector for the production of electricity, for cement a little bit. But otherwise, everybody knew that you know steel would depend on coal forever. So they, they like the engineers, the experts, the, the, the statisticians. Even when they see oil, uh, I mean, getting bigger and bigger, they know that coal will remain. So a big part of you know moving forward and at least you know having large relative additions of new power sources uh, is the underlying infrastructure. So for coal, obviously it's these mines, it's the pit props, it's the railroads to transport at the steam engines to, to drain out the flooding of the coal mines. Um, and people talk a lot about, you know, the kind of supremacy of oil because it's a liquid hydrocarbon, it's incredibly energy dense, uh, you know, being a liquid, it's, it's actually quite easy to move around, but not until you have the infrastructure. So I want to talk about what I'm going to call one of the first gigafactories, um, which is uh, the Rockefeller's wooden barrel factory. And just we'll talk a little bit about the historic um, symbiosis of oil with wood in, in those examples. Uh, but there's some really interesting contemporary ones with regards to the suburbs. So let's let's hit up those two examples. Yeah, well, the kind of small anecdote that makes history of tech funny, I think. The big age of the wooden barrel is like the, eight, the 1910s, 1920s. Mm, that way. Uh, because of oil. Uh, I mean, oil in the U.S. Uh, creates a new kind of wooden barrel manufacturers, heavily mechanized, huge uh, factories and indeed the biggest uh, wooden barrel manufacturers of the world is John D Rockefeller because he's also the biggest uh, oil man of course uh, of the of the early 20th century um, and so you've got uh, factories uh, in, of uh, in the in the 1910 1920s in the US producing more wooden barrels than all London at the same time, when London was, of course, the biggest uh, port. Uh, so there was, of course, a, a very large cooperage industry in, in London. Um, these uh, wooden barrels were then exported to France and they were washed and then used for uh, the transportation of wine, you know, this kind of uh, serious problems. Um, anyway, so, yeah, there are many kind of surprising uh, connections between the, between the materials. So the idea that oil is so wonderful because it is liquid, Actually, no, it's a nightmare. It's a logistic nightmare because uh, it leaks. And that's, of course, extremely uh, labor intensive to, to prevent the leakage of, of, of barrels. Um, and then, of course, I mean, until the, 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 the 1930s, the derricks are made of wood. And derricks, you know, they are kind of heavy infrastructure, like 30 tons at least. And there is almost a million uh, oil, uh, oil wells which are digged, drilled in the U.S. before 1930. So it's a lot of wood, uh, once again. You know? um, so, yes, I mean, this, this, you really have to, to have a kind of um, sy systemic vision of, of the raw materials and energies. And one of the big defects, I think, in the historiography of energy, it is that it is written by specialists. You've got specialists of coal, specialists of oil, specialists of timber, and they, they have not studied so much interactions between these materials. They are mono-energetic. Right. And, and, and that ability of a novel mode of transportation, the car, to open up uh, a different kind of suburban environment, um, I found that fascinating. The, the actual physical symbiosis of oil and wood in the form of new construction materials that enabled you know, productivity revolution. Uh, just go into that a little bit, because I, I just thought that was a, another unexpected symbiosis. I mean, yeah, it's kind of obvious, but um, basically the first, the, I mean, in the 20th century, uh, in rich countries, the first uh, steel, uh, I mean, the first use of wood is to, to produce energy, to burn the wood. That remained the first use of energy, of wood, sorry. 
Uh, and then the second is construction. The second sector is construction. The third is packaging. And both construction and packaging are driven by oil consumption. Uh, and the suburban oil environment, which is made possible by oil, of course, uh, is of course a very strong, uh, uh, a very, it opens very large market for, for, for timber, um, especially in the US and in Canada, uh, where, where, where t- timber construction is very, very, very common. It's completely dominating, actually. About 90% of the, of the house in, in the US is uh, timber framed. You know, it's, uh, it's really a very, very big uh, uh, sector. Um, and then there is a metamorphosis of wood. Just like with creosote, like coal transforming timber, uh, wood has been completely transformed by oil, thanks to plywood, 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 I don't know if I, I pronounce it, plywood, which is a, a kind of revolutionary materials. R- really, it's really increased the, the productivity in the construction industry radically. Uh, you've got also uh, particle boards later, uh, plaster boards, all these kind of uh, neglected technologies have tremendous impact in the most important economic sector, which is construction. I mean, this is something that very often is kind of uh, forgotten in history of capitalism or history of energy. Like the construction industry is the biggest industry. And it is where capital, capital accumulates. If you take, uh, in Europe, more than 50% of uh, assets is uh, housing. In the US, it's slightly less, but very close to 50%. So if you want to have a history of capitalism, you really need to talk about houses, and you need to talk about very basic technologies, such as plywood, plasterboard, uh, concrete mixer, uh, wheelbarrow, shovels. I mean, this is really what history of uh, energy and capitalism is about, I think. And, and in the same way, if you take like the standard book in the history of energy, they're obsessed with engines, with new motors, the steam engine, the interna- internal combustion engine. But in fact, housing and, and uh, it's like 30% of energy consumption, 30% of uh, CO2 emissions, you know. So it's, it's really a major, major sector. So uh, speaking of those engines, um, this is another interaction between oil and the forest, uh, one of many. Uh, the chainsaw, the logging truck. I'm, I'm from the country of the lumberjack. You know, uh, I have uh, ancestors that swung axes in the woods, but we had to move those logs down our great rivers. Uh, these uh, fellows in striped shirts with, uh, you know, nails on the bottom of their shoes doing really dangerous work, moving the logs uh, just in, in the spring. Um, that equation of sort of uh, forest and, and timber product availability was dramatically altered uh, by, by oil. So tell us, tell us a bit about that story. I mean, once again, I mean, this, this, and this is well known. I think there is a complete revolution in forestry after World War II, thanks to oil. Um, the chainsaw, I th- actually, it's, a, it's quite a late development. I mean, it's invented in, the, in 1927 in Germany, but it's really massively used only in the 1950s in the US and 1960s in Europe, you know, because chainsaw were expensive before, before the 1950s and, and they were heavy, they were cumbersome. But then starting from the 1950s and 60s, they, I mean, they are everywhere. And of course, it increased, uh, I mean, the chainsaw increased productivity of the, of the, of the lumberjack uh, quite, quite, Quite radically, then you've got other like skidders, forwarders. Uh, I mean, s- special trucks that makes uh, the moving of logs much easier. Then there, is the, there are the forestry roads, which are very important. Actually, w- what makes the value of a forest? It's uh, it's uh, it's connection. Uh, so if you got a road, of course, then the the wood is is available. Um, so all these technologies depend on oil. And then oil has also created a kind of new revolution in, 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 in wood production, which is the forest plantation of eucalyptus. I mean, quite a new phenomenon from the 1960s in Spain, Portugal, uh, in Brazil, uh, in, I mean, in, uh, then in China, of course, in the 90s. And, and um, eucalyptus has really an incredible productivity. Uh, like Brazilian plantations of eucalyptus, they can reach 40 cubic meters per year. Just to give you a point of comparison, like a normal forest uh, in, in Europe would, in the early 20th century would be just two to three cubic meters per year. So you are producing 20 times more wood, you know. And, and of course, it is possible thanks to oil, 
because you need fertilizers you, or, or gas uh, fertilizers, you need nitrogen fertilizer to have these kind of productivities. So like the eucalyptus plantation, on 3% of the, of the forest area, they produce 30% of the woody biomass. And this is made for packaging. And packaging is another example of this kind of symbiosis, which are not present in the history of energy, but which are very important. Uh, today, in rich countries, wood energy has increased a lot in Europe, in the US. Uh, and this is in part due to the packaging industry and the paper industry. I mean, the paper industry is a very, very large industry. Uh, it's you know, economically, it's bigger than the aerospace industry, for instance, because packaging is everywhere, of course. And the paper industry is like uh, the fourth industrial consumer of energy. So it's really, you know, like the first is steel, of course, then you've got cement, all the chemical industries, and then you've got paper. Uh, and it is driven by, by packaging. And in, from the 1960s, they start to use the, the black liquors, which is a residue of paper production to energize their, uh, their their machines. Are we are we burning more wood than ever? Are we you know at that at that peak as well? Oh no, I mean uh, wood has expanded a lot in the 20th century. It keeps expanding. Um, so just the black liquors uh, right now in Europe produces more energy than solar. Uh, in US, it is quite recently that uh, wind power has uh, as overpassed uh, the black liquors. No, we are talking about some serious, you know, black liquors is not marginal, it's very big. And today in Europe, uh, wood energy is three times bigger than solar, uh, wind power and hydraulic energy in terms of primary energy. So no, I mean, we're not talking about marginal things. And that's a very classic uh, distortion. Uh, we are obsessed with the novelty. So solar panel is going to make the front page, but wood energy, we're not going to talk about it, whereas it's much, much more important for the moment. You know, I'm not saying that like in 20 years, probably solar will be bigger, but for the moment, wood energy is a very, very serious thing. And I'm talking about the rich countries. If you Now, if you talk about the poor countries, of course, wood energy is enormous. I mean, wood energy nowadays provides uh, energy for cooking, for getting warm, to more than 2 billion people. Uh, in terms of uh, final energy, it's bigger than nuclear energy. And um, for instance, there has been a, a very strong expansion of uh, charcoal in, in, in poor countries in the 1960s. Actually, it's the first time in the history of humanity that you've got uh, cities, more than 10 million inhabitant cities that are using charcoal to cook their food. Uh, like a, a large African city like Lagos or Dar es Salaam, uh, or, I mean, they can burn more than 2 million tons of charcoal a year. Paris in the 1860s was just 100,000 tons a year. So it's another order of magnitude. So, I mean, really, wood energy is very new. It's very recent. It's nowadays that we are uh, burning more wood, that we are burning more, the most coal, the most oil. Right, right. So there's also this kind of narratives of progress and, you know, the march of time, right? Um, and we're going to get into Cesare Marchetti and, and, and some of that stuff a little bit later. But, you know, we think that these transitions are just moving in one direction. And we have a few examples of that going backwards, one with wood. And, you know, maybe this is just distortions of subsidies and the way that we uh, will label certain sources low carbon. But just tell us a bit about the Drax uh, power plant in, in the UK, because I thought that was a really interesting example. Yeah, it's a funny example because, of course, um, so Drax, Drax, first of all, Drax is um, a coal power plant, which was uh, converted to biomass uh, around, two, uh, around the year 2000, with a lot of subsidies. Uh, you're right, actually. Uh, and, of course, the pretext was climate change. Uh, but biomass is a good name for, for wood, wood which is extracted from Canada and from the US. Uh, it is, of course, uh, transported to Britain with uh, boats using diesel. Uh, but, I mean, the striking thing is the quantity of wood. Uh, we are talking about more than 10 million tons of wood per year, uh, which is four times more than what Britain burned in the 18th century in just one power plant. Uh, so we, we reached the great result that after two centuries of energy transition, Britain, which is, of course, the, 
the leading countries of energy transition, the first uh, industrialized country and the first country uh, getting out of uh, fossil fuels. I mean, they pretend, actually. Um, Britain used four times more wood to produce their energy now than in the 18th century. And, and just to produce 1.5% of their energy. Because it's, I mean, compared to all the energy, of course, it's not that big. Uh, so, and, and I think this example shows, of course, the, um, I mean, the, 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 the fact that the project of using biomass to have the same kind of economy that we created with fossil fuels is going nowhere. It won't work. There is not just enough biomass to do that. I mean, you've got the same kind of issue about uh, sustainable aviation fuels, which are very popular uh, at, the, at the European Commission. There are incentives for, for the aviation companies to use sustainable aviation fuels. Um, if you take the case of France, France burns each year 9 million tons of, uh, of jet, uh, jet fuels. Uh, and the whole production of, of oil uh, in France is 2 million tons. And oil is the best substance to make uh, jet fuels. So, I mean, there's not enough biomass to do that. It just doesn't work. Forests are also really leaned upon in um, climate models uh, as, uh, you know, really integral part, particularly, you know, <laughs> in this desperation. Um, and it's well-meaning. I get it. I share it. You know, I like the Holocene. I would like to, you know, lower our uh, PPM of, of CO2 a little bit. But it leads to some pretty magical thinking and really like collective delusions, which I think your book is um Doing the important work, um, it's 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 jarring. It's just some cognitive dissonance, but I I, I do uh, <laughs> I'm not a fan of of the, the bliss of ignorance. Um, but again, tell us uh, a little bit about um, you know we have big plans for bioenergy, carbon capture, and storage. You talked about the incredible productivity of the eucalyptus plantations. Um, so we want to get off of fossil fuels and we want to use forests as carbon sinks. Why why doesn't this quite work out? Well, there are several issues. Uh, first of all. Wood, just like uh, the other uh, energy, uh, is in symbiosis with oil. I mean, I mentioned the chainsaw, uh, the trucks, and so on. Um, if you look at the literature, uh, the forestry literature, you can say that basically between one to two liters of diesel is required to produce one cubic meter of wood. So when we are talking about, you know, like a carbon neutral energy, this is just false. I mean, in a very simple way. Uh, and then there is the issue of uh, negative emission with with forest. Uh, and I mean, it's really at the end of the book that I reached the, the, this issue. Um, in the integrated assessment models, which are used to uh, create scenarios of net zero by 2050 or 2070, um, basically the modelers need a lot of negative emissions. When I say a lot, it's really a lot. In the last IPCC uh, report of the group three, the, the one which is uh, looking at solutions, uh, it's a 2022 report. Uh, if I remember correctly, across the different range of scenarios, you need between you need to store uh, by 2100 between 170 gigatons of CO2 to 900 gigatons of CO2. Sorry, there are a lot of numbers, but just to give you a uh, comparison, it's several times more the production of food today that you would need to uh, to, to put in, in, in the ground. To do that, they, they use BECS, Bioenergy Carbon Capture and Storage. You produce electricity with wood, you capture the CO2 at the exit of the chimneys, and then you bury that under the ground. I mean, a technology that doesn't exist, that is completely non-competitive. Drax, I mean, normally Drax uh, should be equipped with carbon capture and storage equipment, and they don't have it because it's it just breaks all the, I mean, you need a lot of electricity to capture the CO2. Uh, basically, if you want to do carbon capture and storage, you need to, for three, three power plants, you need to build a fourth power plant to produce electricity to capture the CO2. So it's rubbish, you know, that won't exist. And that's really something which troubles me a lot. Like, what is the political, um, what is the political meaning of these scenarios? What do they do to the public discussion on climate change? I think that they create more illusion uh, and procrastination than anything else. Because 
The result of that is how the science has the scenarios to get us to net zero by 2050. You just have to listen to the scientists. But when you look at their reports, they are completely, you know, imaginary. They are using technologies that are not scalable, that are not competitive. I mean, in, for, 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 again, for the banks, uh, there, are, there were articles showing that to produce enough wood to capture all these gigatons of CO2, you would need um, plantations of the size of three times India, you know, of, of, of plantations of, of fast-growing trees to produce the biomass that would produce electricity that then would be... Uh, so, I mean, yeah, there, there is a serious issue here. Presumably, again, those fast-growing trees are dependent upon fossil fuel inputs, um, Haber-Bosch, nitrogen. Yeah, so we, we there is no disentangling or escaping uh, from these from these symbioses. Um, one one of the phrases in your book um, is basically that you know raw materials and energy sources they they don't go out of fashion. Again, we use more and more and more. Um, there are, however. I can't remember. It's like a tiny handful, maybe only five uh, raw materials that we're using less of. Um, one of them actually is doing something good for the forest. Uh, <laughs> so to tell us about that. The wool. Uh, I thought that, that was interesting. Yeah, wool. yeah right. Yeah. yeah. Uh, okay. Yeah. I mean, that's you now, and I mean, a very, very obvious fact. I mean, it's really at the beginning of the book, I explained that why people have talked about transition. I think they have projected a model, an intellectual model of the S-curve diffusion of technologies on the issue of energy or materials. But that doesn't work like this. I mean, technology do become obsolete sometimes, obsolete sometimes but uh, raw materials are never obsolete. It's a very obvious point, I think. Um, there is one raw material that has decreased, and it is wool, indeed, cheap wool, uh, because of oil, actually, because you've got synthetic fibers. Uh, another example would be asbestos, asbestos, because there were prohibitions in certain countries, and that, of course, makes uh, the, the, the global consumption decrease. But otherwise, despite all the innovations, and especially in organic chemistry, there are so many new products, new substances, raw materials always increase. I mean, it's really a, a very, very, I think, disturbing empirical fact that needs to be taken into account when we talk too lightly about, you know, innovation, disruptive innovation, uh, and all this rubbish to solve our environmental issues. This is really, really very strange discourse. And some some of the narratives uh, common amongst uh, those of the kind of eco-modernist persuasion, that response to these environmental questions of, of limits. Um, again, one of them is, again, that, you know, this transition to coal to more energy-dense fuels um, saved the forests. And I think you've pretty decisively demonstrated that that is not true. But there's another great mythology, and that's about how uh, the oilmen of Texas saved uh, saved the whales. Um, so it, it's a nice story, but uh, it turns out maybe it's not true. <laughs> yeah, this is a very, a very old story. I mean, from the I, I put a caricature of 1860-something uh, where you've got the, the whales giving a toast to the discovery of oil in Pennsylvania uh, in 1861. Uh, because, of course, uh, supposedly oil would save uh, the whales. And then the story is uh, is really repeated by the oil industry from the 1930s onward. When we talk about the environmental effect of oil industry, they always say, oh, no, we are the good guys. We know we have saved the oil, the, the whales. You know? um, and, of course, it is so stupid. I mean, just a few elements uh, like three times more uh, whales were killed in the 20th century than in the 19th century. And they were killed with boats, much more powerful boats using diesel engine. Uh, so oil was, of course, very uh, useful to kill whales. Uh, and then the, I mean, the funniest part, I think, is that the, the very last uh, drops of, of, of uh, spermacity oil were probably used in um, a jet engine because it's an excellent lubricant. And they were also used in um, automatic uh, cars. You know, like for, for very good uh, lubricants, you need a, a small part of oil, oil which has very interesting uh, property that I cannot uh, explain. But, you know, so, yeah, of course, this is rubbish. And if something saved uh, the whales, 
uh, it is first of all Greenpeace, I think, like the environmentalist movement and some kind of radical environmentalism, and the Hoho battery. Not a very well-known character in the story, but it's a, a tree, uh, I think, growing from in Mexico primarily, and then which was cultivated in Israel, and they make plantation of hoho battery to uh, to replace the, the lubricant that were um, derived from from whale oil. So yes, no, the, the oil did not save the whale. I mean, of course, it's a funny story, but the very uh, sad thing is that the, the experts and the economists, experts on climate change, like William Nordhaus, you know, they buy the story. And they repeat the story all the time. William Nordhaus, um, one of the important characters in my book, uh, Nobel Prize in, tw- in 2018 for his work on the economics of climate change. You find that in his articles. You know, like, yeah, of course, it's through innovation that we will save climate, just as it is with oil that we save uh, the, the whales. You know? So this kind of mythology, you know, they are even present among the people who should know, I think. Okay, so we've, I think, covered not exhaustively because there's more in the book, by the book. It's an incredible book. Um, but I think we've covered the symbiosis chapter um, of this episode. Um, let's talk a bit. You, you mentioned, I think, part of the rationale as to why this has been missed. And there's been this phasist history of energy, people being siloed. Um, that's becoming more and more common, I think, in our modern world as things become more complex. Um, but let's talk about, um, you know, how how these ideas became to be dominant, and partic- particularly the idea of the energy transition. As a bit of a nuclear fanatic, I was really surprised that uh, the term energy transition actually originates um, with uh, nuclear scientists. So uh, maybe maybe start us off there as we branch into chapter two of this episode. Yeah. So, I mean, the second part is really about how, basically, you, you can't tell the story of energy talking about transition, so how, how it became so dominant. It's kind of an obvious question, you know. Um, I mean, the, f- the first thing to, 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 not, to be noticed is that it's a fairly recent concept. I mean, for the most part of the 20th century, experts would comment on energy dynamics without using the word energy transition, because they, obviously there was no energy transition. Um, there is one group of scientists who start to talk about energy in a different way, and they are the atomic scientists. And there are a small group of atomic scientists. They are the members of the Manhattan Project, and they were working at the Metallurgical Laboratory in Chicago during the Manhattan Project. And they were amazed by the quantity of energy that you can get out of uranium if you got the breeder reactor, the fast neutron reactor. This is really a key thing. I mean, the, the nuclear they wanted, the nuclear energy they wanted is not the fission that we have, is an, another kind of nuclear energy, is the, the breeder reactor. And it is true that in theory you can have access to like mil, uh, hundreds of thousands of years of energy uh, if you have uh, the, the breeder reactor because you burn all sorts of isotopes, the U235, the U238. So it gives you like a uh, kind of infinite temporal horizon. And for those atomic scientists, it was a very important argument because it demonstrated that what they had did was not just a terrible instrument of death, it was also a key technology to save industrial civilization in the very long term. Mm-hmm. And so they are, they, are, they are really thinking about energy not in decades, not, not even in centuries, but in millennia. That's really something very particular to those to these nuclear scientists that the other people didn't do at that time. And it is also for this reason that, the, that they are really among the first to study properly climate change. I think this is something new in the book. I show the importance of the Atomic Energy Commission, the U.S. Atomic Energy Commission, for the first studies, new studies of climate change. It's because they have new instruments, they have uh, what they, I mean, what is called a mass spectrographer. I'm not going to enter into many details, but basically it allows you to have palo temperatures using the isotopes of oxygen. And also they have a very good argument because, of course, climate change is a very strong argument to, uh, to, 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 to promote nuclear energy. And as soon as 1953, I mean, it's very early on, there is a report uh, uh, by the Atomic Energy Commission saying that there is an issue with climate change and we have to study that. You know, the, the guy who coins uh, the words energy transition is an atomic scientist called Harrison Brown. 
a very interesting character. He's also a leading uh, Malthusian. He's obsessed with the problem of demographic growth. And atomic energy is a way to solve this problem of, of demographic growth. And in a way, in, I mean, energy transition is actually a word coming from atomic physics. It's a change of an electron around its nucleus. And so Harrison Brown is just recycling his, you know, his own expertise to talk about energy and the future of energy. And so, yes, energy transition is really rooted into this uh, atomic expertise and this uh, promotion of atomic energy. Um, but, I mean, what I like about these atomic scientists is that they recognize that, you know, it, it, it won't happen tomorrow, especially at a global scale. When you look at their graphs, they, I mean, like, there's a very famous graph by, um, by Mayon King Hubbard with the theoretician of peak oil. He's not an atomic scientist, he's a geologist, but from 1955 onward, he's recruited by the Atomic Energy Commission and he becomes an important lobbyist for the Atomic Energy Commission. But when you look really, uh, you know, uh, cautiously at, at what he's saying, basically in the US it's going to, to go quite quickly. By 2020, there would be no more oil in the US. Not a very good guess, anyway. Um, but con conventional oil did peak when he called it in. Yeah, it is true. Like, like conventional oil peaked in when he said, like, 1970-something. Yeah, that's right. Um, but for, for the whole world, they know there is a lot of coal, so they see the, the end of fossil fuels in three or four centuries. You know, the, like the, the energy transition will be achieved, will be finished, will be over by in, in the 23rd or 24th century, you know. And, and what I try to explain in the last part of the book is how come that this very strange futurology of shift, entirely shifting from one energy source to another, uh, which is radically strange, radically heterodoxical. I mean, it's not, it's not in this way that normal experts on, an ener on energy uh, really uh, thought about energy. How come that this very strange futurology became the dominant futurology? And, and it, it, there is a kind of, you know, scientific scandal, I think, that we, we recycled a notion, energy transition, which was supposed to take place in three or four centuries, and which was driven by the increasing price of fossil fuels, because it was the, uh, the growing scarcity of coal that would make nuclear energy uh, competitive, and that it would prevail because coal would be too expensive to be mined, right? We have transferred this futurology for climate change, which is a completely different problem. Uh, we have to go out to, to, to get out of fossil fuel, not in three or four centuries, but in three or four decades. We have to do, do, that, to do that globally. And we have to do that without the uh, price incentive, because coal is still very cheap, you know, compared to, to, to even to solar energy, if you take into account uh, the, the intermittent character of solar energy, coal is, is cheaper. So it's, it's, it's really a strange story, I think, that uh, you know, the expert accepted this idea of energy transition, right? It, it was certainly not mainstream in 1970. So, I mean, part of the naivete of um, the thinking here in terms of replacement um, it comes down to, I guess, questions of energy fungibility. I mean, the reason that wood persists is because it has a series of properties to it. You know, coal similarly, um, you know, it, it you can store large amounts of it. It's a solid, it's cheap, et cetera. You know, it has chemical properties that you can, it can harness much more so with oil. Um, but it, it feels like because of the way that we measure energy, that's, that's part of what leads into this slightly delusional thinking. So kilowatt hours, British thermal units, um, is that is that a kind of big big part of the story, just in terms of the historiography? I mean, first of all, we have taken in like for granted the fact that coal was just coal, but in fact, coal is a lot of wood, for instance, and oil is not just oil; it's plenty of coal to produce the steel and so on. So there, there is this aspect, and the other reason for the success of this uh, fungibility uh, imagination of uh, around energy uh, is the obsession with electricity. I mean. If the atomic scientists talk about energy transition, it's also because what they have in mind is, of course, uh, the production of electricity. And it is true that for the production of electricity, there is, yes, a part of fungibility. I mean, nuclear energy can replace coal for the production of electricity, indeed. But production of electricity is just one, just one part of the problem, just one part of the energy production, and just one part, like 40% of CO2 emissions. So I think we have also projected on 
all the rest, imaginaries, discourses that were invented to reflect upon the electric, the, the, the market of electricity production. So uh, this was this was another you know wasn't wasn't a major focus of the book, but uh, in terms again of this history of energy and and you know someone who has advocated very strongly for nuclear energy on on a variety of. Uh, measures, um, partially caught up in this delusion of energy transition. Um, there was this moment of, of kind of utopian thinking about hydroelectricity. This was really, I guess, when the electric age was, was kind of beginning. Uh, but I'd love it if you could just delve into that briefly as a little uh, a little tangent. Yeah, among the, I would say among the ancestors of the idea of energy transition, they, they didn't choose the word energy transition, but they had this idea that like uh, around 1900s, that in the future, all energy would come from electricity and this electricity would be produced with hydraulic energy. It is very present among a very influential historian called Louis Mumford. Louis Mumford is really, really a very influential figure in the history of tech, in the US in particular. Um, he's seen as a very serious author, but when you read his book like um, called, um, oh gosh, I forgot the title, the 1932 book, Techniques and Civilization, uh, the 1932 book is saying very strange things, you know, uh, for him that uh, hydroelectricity will replace completely coal. But like 20 years before, the statisticians were showing that, no, I mean, hydroelectricity has a lot of potential, but it cannot replace entirely coal. It's rather seen as something that which uh, allow to economize coal, but not to replace it uh, and, and also he has this very uh, stagist vision of history. So there is the, uh, the, the aeotechnic age, which was wind power, uh, hydro power. Then there is the paleotechnic age, which is coal, and the neotechnic age, which is electricity created, I mean, produced with, with, uh, with um, hydraulic energy. Uh, and he has these very strange words, like he's surprised that there is still wood in the age of iron, for instance. You know, so he's part of this uh, stagist narrative of the material history of humanity, which is created at the turn of the beginning of the 20th century, in part because people are really amazed by electricity. And it's true, it's an amazing technology. <laughs> I mean, if, among all the technologies of the, uh, it's difficult to imagine a world, uh, a world without electricity. So, of course, it's a very important technology, but, you know, they, they, they it's all the rubbish about the electrical age. And, and then we had the same thing with the atomic age in the 1950s. I mean, the same, the same errors, the same uh, uh, misconceptions about, you know, this new technology, which is going to change everything. We have it all over the place with AI. We have that again. I mean, it's, it's part of the, yeah, the, the hype around innovation, which is very powerful. And the problem is that this, this, this very strong emphasis on, on innovation has been replicated in history. And on this, on this key, key point, I was really inspired by a very important historian of tech called David Edgerton, a British colleague, who has written a wonderful book called The Shock of the Old. It was 2006, if I remember correctly. And it was really a, a very important source of inspiration for my, for my own work on energy. So, I mean, there's this kind of utopian element to it. And I think, you know, net zero is a bit of a utopia, right? Climate stabilization. Um, the hydroelectric age was, you know, we're going to clean up the skies. There wouldn't be air pollution, get people out of cities, change, um, you know, the relationships of workers and capitalists, et cetera. Um, <clears throat> when it came to these atomic Malthusians, they were specifically imagining the breeder reactor, you know, making the, the deserts bloom, for instance. So, um, Yes, speak a bit about that, because I thought that was pretty fascinating. And also, again, on this question of fungibility, uh, a recognition that, okay, electricity can't do it all. We've got to use nuclear to basically replace all the other stuff. And to do that, we need hydrogen. So I think this gets us to Cesare Marchetti. Yeah, uh, yeah. I mean, new technologies are very often old story of repetition and, 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 uh, and hypes, indeed. Um, so for, for the case of uh, the atomic age uh, and solving the, 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 the problem of demographic growth, um, the, 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 the atomic scientists that I mentioned were Malthusians, and they explained that with atomic energy, you can mass produce fertilizers, nitrogen, you can desalinate water, the water of the oceans, and you can also uh, recycle the phosphorus, which is dissolved in the oceans. There is like a few ppm per cubic meters of phosphorus, but you've got so much energy that you can do whatever you want, basically. And so you can um, 
you can open to cultivation the vast arid land of the planet and you can solve uh, the problem of, 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 of producing food uh, and so, solve uh, famine and so on. It was really actually important in the US in the 1960s because uh, under the Johnson presidency, there was this idea that to fight communism, you need to uh, control demographic growth in poor countries. Demo demographic growth would create uh, poverty and therefore revolutions and would be bad for, for the for the West. Uh, and so Harrison Brown, you know, he gets subsidies from the State Department to, to, to study these problems. Um, and and the, I mean, the hydrogen example, that's an interesting case, I think, uh, because of course nowadays hydrogen is seen as the, you know, one of the key uh, key element of the energy transition to and, 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 the, and the path to net zero. Um, it was first promoted by a very interesting character called Cesare Marchetti. He's an Italian atomic scientist uh, working uh, at, uh, with General Electric in the US and at Euratom in, in Europe. And from the 19, early 1960s, he explained that hydrogen is absolutely indispensable if you want nuclear energy to become important. He's a very strong promoter of nuclear energy. And if, you, if nuclear energy is constraining the market of electricity production, it, it will remain small. So what you need is to produce uh, hydrogen to replace oil. And then you, I mean, you start to become serious, you know. So he has this fantastic project of building huge nuclear plants in the middle of the oceans, because in the middle of oceans, people would, would not complain. And the, the people were afraid about the thermal effect of nuclear production. It, it would create so much heat that it would be terrible for, for the environment. So if you build them in the middle of the Pacific Oceans, you can cool the, the reactor properly. And um, for instance, he said that um, Japan would become like the, the new Saudi Arabia, thanks to this uh, nuclear plant in the middle of uh, of Pacific of the, of the Pacific Ocean, for for the nuclear residues, they are so hot that they would self sink uh, in the floor on, on the ocean's floor. So yeah, he has a kind of you know Doctor Folamour uh, character, uh, but at the same time, and, and these were like tw these were like these were like twenty gigawatt um, nuclear stations in Pacific atolls, yeah, and and I guess that on barges they were floating nuclear plants, yeah. Right, right. And, and I mean, but we hear that now. I mean, we hear about uh, Australia becoming the Saudi Arabia of hydrogen because of, uh, you know, its incredible solar resources. So this stuff is not, you know, it, it, what was the title of the book again? It's <laughs> stuff is old, right? No, no it never dies. Um, but the, so is, is this kind of, you know, of like atomic scientists with grand vision, but at the same time is kind of rigorous because he, he's really worried about the time that this atomic utopia would take. And is the author of extremely famous curves, like wave curves. I mean, if, if, you're, if you know a little bit about history of energy, it's a very influential vision of, of energy. You put all the energy sources in shares, in relative terms, and you trace curves, and you see nice uh, logistic curves of diffusion and replacement. And he has a... I mean, he understands or explains that, you know, energy transition will take time, a lot of time. And it's, a, it's an interesting argument because what is doing this to uh, discuss uh, his colleagues' work, uh, futurologists, uh, forecasters who are using computers, computer models to show that, yes, you can get out of fossil fuels in 50 years. This is uh, exactly the same, I mean, the, the same goal that we have now, but in 1972, it was the goal that was, um, that was uh, fixed for a group of researchers at YASA. YASA is International Institute for Applied System Analysis, an extremely important group of researchers uh, in terms of energy modeling at, in, near Vienna in Austria. It's an international uh, institution. And they are using the first computer models to produce the integrated assessment, assessment models. You know, we're talking about models that were uh, uh, elaborated in 1972, and they are still used today. That's something which, I mean, I was really struck when I discovered that. Basically, the YASA made the, 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 the first energy models that are still used by the IPCC Group 3 
to reflect on the future of energy. And these models demonstrated that there were soft transition paths out of fossil fuels in 50 years. And Marchetti was saying, no, don't believe that. And he was using history, history of energy, to show that, you know, it takes a lot of time. Uh, and the most depressing thing is, I mean, Marchetti was the most pessimistic guy of his times. And he was far too optimistic. For him, coal would have disappeared by 2020, for instance. And you were mentioning Vaclav Mill at the beginning of the, of the talk. Uh, Vaclav Mill has criticized uh, Marchetti, saying that this is rubbish. Look, I mean, coal is still very important. But it's quite unfair because Marchetti, you know, was the most pessimistic guy among very optimistic uh, people at Yaza. And even the most pessimistic guy turned out to be far too optimistic about our ability uh, to, to get out of coal. Another, yeah, I mean, what's what's fascinating again is these examples of sort of again in this terms of historiography of, of progress and moving well marchetti talked about this right moving from longer hydrocarbon chains getting rid of the, the carbon to hydrogen ratio shrinking until we're just using hydrogen um but as a product of the oil crisis we have a you know march backwards in history a detransition if it was if it, if you will uh back to back to coal and i think maybe marchetti wasn't anticipating the rise of of india and china um, can you talk about just the extraordinary return to coal and, and how that upset his vision? Yes, I mean that, that's something that um, was. I mean, it was anticipated among some some people the fact that you know, like the big expansion of coal will be in China, um, and I think that's a really a key issue to understand why so little was done about climate change in the late seventies. It's really at the, at the end of the book, I study, you know, how in the U.S. all these questions were already on the table in the late 70s. Uh, there is the Charney report in 1979 about climate change. Uh, they showed that the climate sensibility uh, is 2.5 degrees. So they have a very good, uh, uh, a very good approximation of, of, of the effect of the doubling of the CO2 content of the atmosphere. Um, there is no climatoskeptics at that time. Even Exxon is, you know, saying, yes, of course, there is climate change. Um, and I think part of the reason why the, the U.S. government kind of buried the issue, well, first there is the Reagan, of course, which is an important cause of, I mean, uh, forgetting about this issue, the Reagan presidency, but it is also the fact that they, know, they knew that China would become the first emitter in a very short time. Uh, in 1979, there is um, an international conference on coal. Interestingly enough, it is uh, led by uh, Carol Wilson. Carol Wilson is the first head of the Atomic Energy Commission, a very strong promoter of atomic energy. Uh, he, he, push, he pushed the issue of climate change in the 1970s. And then at the end of the 1970s, he's very disappointed with the success of nuclear energy. I mean, there is not so, so many reactors that have been bought and he, he thinks that the that the, the Westinghouse model is not that good, so he said that we have to expand coal uh, to just to answer the growing demand of electricity in the poor world. So he organized uh, an international conference. The Chinese uh, representative said that by the year 2000 we expect China to burn three gigatons of coal, which is more than the whole world consumption of coal in 1979. So, yeah, I mean, it was obvious that the climate change will hap would happen, you know, even if the U.S. were trying to have some any kind of climate policy, it would not change so much. So there is a very strong sense of resignation in the, in the late 70s, early 80s. Uh, the, same things, the same thing happened in Britain. There is a very interesting archive uh, in the Thatcher cabinet of, of, uh, of 1989. Margaret Thatcher organized a meeting with all his uh, cabinet member, members. And one after the other, they explained that basically, yes, there is climate change, of course, but you can't do much. Because, I mean, like for, for the transport minister says, yes, you could increase uh, the offer of public uh, transportation, but it's not clear that people would just uh, drop their car and use auto buses. Might not work like that. Um, the only thing that you can do is put very high taxes on, on, on oil, 
on, on, on gasoline, but frankly, you don't want to do that. It's not very popular. Um, and the Ministry of Energy says, you know, Britain is 3% of CO2 emissions. In a few decades, in two or three decades, it will be just 1%, so we can't do much. And the best that we can hope is that we will adapt. And another key reason why very little was done or nothing was done at all, actually, on climate change uh, at that time, it's not for the climato-skeptics. I don't buy this story. I think they're not that influential. It's the trust in the fact that which countries can adapt. I mean, another, I think, discovery that truly really amazed me is the fact that as early as 1976 in the US, there are discussions about adaptation to climate change. 1976, there is a colloquium organized living with climate change. And basically the issue is, of course, there is climate change. We can't do much. Is it really bad for the US? Well, for the US, three degrees is completely acceptable. Uh, it's a very large country. You can uh, move uh, agricultural production uh, according to climate change. You have new, uh, you will have new seeds. GMOs is very fashionable at that time. Um, yeah, I mean, and th th there is a very strong cynicism because they explain that for poor countries, it will be much, much harder. Yeah. Um, right, right. So, uh, Part, part of the story is, uh, you know, one of um, absolute versus relative transitions. Um, there's certainly like local examples of transitions. I'm from Ontario and Canada. Um, we outstripped our hydroelectric potential very early on in the development of our province, started building a lot of coal. We don't have our own coal, so we're importing it, much like France, um, you know, not having its own coal and going nuclear. Um, and so those are certainly pretty convincing examples and maybe pushbacks on energy transition. And I guess some people would say, you know, poor countries are still using coal because they're poor. And as they get richer, they'll they'll transition to gas and we'll have, you know, Marchetti's march towards uh, the promised land of, of uh, eliminating carbon altogether from energy systems and, and just doing hydrogen. Is that like, I don't know, is there anything to that? I mean, in a very long term, why not? I mean, uh, but if you look at market curves, it's some somewhere in the 22nd century, you know, that I think we are really out of fossil fuels and gas, natural gas. So it's much, much, much too slow for, for the climate issue. So, no, I think, to, I mean, the more reasonable is to say that, you know, we cannot count on the fast diffusion of nuclear at a global level because it's, expensive, complicated. There are very few companies that can build nuclear plants. It's a key thing. I mean, in front, they want to build six nuclear reactors or eight, eight new nuclear reactors. Uh, and EDF said, we can't do more, actually. I mean, it's really the maximum that we can do uh, before 2050, you know, because it's, yeah, it's, it's very complicated civil engineering. Um, and each reactor is kind of unique. Uh, you need it's a very big uh, construction site. Uh, you need uh, cranes. You need you know, yeah. I mean, I, I've I've talked about that with François Morin, who, that you that you that you know, is a very good uh, expert on nuclear energy and a very strong promoter of nuclear energy. But yeah, he recognized the fact that we are talking about you know very serious uh, civil construction uh, that is not. Uh, reachable in many countries, I think. So, no, I, I mean, the, uh, the marketing utopia was a very long-term utopia. And that's why it was, I mean, it, it was, a, a kind, I think, a, what he wanted to say, be reasonable, basically. He was saying that because Yaza was completely obsessed with nuclear and with breeder reactor. The, the chief of Yaza was uh, Wolf Affele, who was the chief of the breeder reactor program in Germany. And yeah, they're a very strong promoter of nuclear energy. Marketi was also a strong promoter of nuclear energy, but he had a better sense of, you know, the, the inertia of the system. Right, right. And, you know, your book is called More and More and More. Uh, unfortunately, the only less there is in terms of these sources of primary energy is, is nuclear. Um, you mentioned biomass. The only less is nuclear. We've, we've dropped in terms of our, of our uh, percentage of primary energy of, of nuclear, even in, in absolute terms. Um, and in Western yeah. countries... It's, it's reverse. I mean, to reverse, China is building like uh, yeah. dozens of nuclear reactors. So it will they work. Are, yeah. yeah, it's it's a temporary temporary setback. It may be political. Um, you know, in terms of that uh, resignation to adaptation, um, there was an EPA report you mentioned, I think, from 1983, um, which was looking at, okay, if we ban 
uh, oil, sorry, shale oil and coal, um, we might be able to delay a temperature rise by a certain number of years. It, it wasn't, I don't remember the exact numbers, but it, it wasn't all that heartening. Um, is there more up-to-date like research or do we just don't, we don't do that research because it gives us such pessimistic answers. Like t- tell, tell us about that report and, and the impact it had. Okay. I, I can talk about the 1983 report, which is of course completely depressing. I mean, basically they are playing with computer models of energy, global energy mix. And they say, okay, if we put like a 300% tax on coal, which is quite big, you know, by the year 2000, it delays uh, the two degree uh, Celsius rise of temperature by, I can't remember, like 10 10 years, perhaps, perhaps 15 years at most. So basically, in the US, they understand that the only thing you can do is delaying the problem. You cannot solve it, which I think is a very, uh, it's quite an important thing to have in mind. You know, Uh, we are buying time, basically. And not a lot of, and not a lot of time, not a lot, in terms of in terms of the the kind of pace of adaptation that's that's required. And you know, certainly we have, uh, you know, we mentioned William Nordhaus. Um, you know, his damage function, his dice. I forget what it stands for, but you know, this kind of economic models of climate change, and that I think three point five degrees Celsius is the ideal temperature for the planet because of optimal temperature three point five. Yeah, but it has been so much so criticized, and I think he has even himself said that okay, I was wrong. I mean that. Uh... I mean, the damage are much, much bigger for each degree of rise of temperature. We're talking about 10% GDP now. I mean, something different. No, yeah, I mean, it's a, it has been completely revived, this model. But that not prevented him of forgetting the Nobel Prize, which is another problem. Right, right. So, you know, where does this leave us? Um, you know, reading your book, uh, you know, again, I have read it three times. Um it's it's fascinating. It feels really novel. Uh, again, it's I don't feel like these these ideas of symbiosis uh, have made it into the Anglosphere, and I don't think your you know deep study of of the history of the concept is here. It's a disruptive idea. It's disquieting. Um, you know, frankly, it's uh, it's it's doesn't leave one in a terribly optimistic state. Um, it's the truth, I think, as far as far as I can tell. Um, you know, adaptation does seem like something that we need to be thinking quite seriously about. Um, but it, it sounds like you're you're not too uh, hopeful that, uh, you know, innovation can can save the day and, and arrive uh, in time. The book is, yeah, it's about arriving in time. I mean, that's the key thing. I mean, you have to take into account the diffusion of technologies that takes time. That, and, and I think, I mean, nowadays, the, the Technofix approach is more um, pushed by promoter of solar energy and, and wind power. Um, and I think these technologies are important because they are cheap. Not 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 wind power, but solar is cheap, so it it can be uh, implemented quickly. But it has many defects, and I think it's important to recognize that it has, it has also limitations. So basically, what we will have in the next decade, I mean, it's basically what the report of the International uh, Energy Agency uh, are saying, we will have probably a kind of flattening of the emissions. Uh, coal might even decrease in the next decades, not disappear, but decrease, thanks to solar energy mainly because uh, it allows to reduce the uh, ah, the factor of the charge. Yeah, the, the, I guess like the fuel the fuel sparing. Yeah, yeah, exactly uh, of of the of the coal plant of the coal plants you know, in China or India and so on. So that's that good news, but it's far from net zero, right? And for gas. And oil, it remains stable or even it depends on the growth of India. If India is growing like six, seven percent like China, then we, I mean, uh, oil and gas will increase. So, yeah, I mean, what, what I'm saying is completely mainstream. I mean, you say it's disquieting, but in fact, it's completely mainstream. What is really marginal and, and strange is the net zero. Uh, what is mainstream is what the international. Uh, energy agency uh, is explaining or what the American equivalent is saying. It's the same thing, more or less. Slightly even more pessimistic, actually, for the U.S. In the U.S. Anyway, um, so I think, yeah, it's reasonable to to think that these forecasters, you know, they, are, they cannot be so wrong that will be net zero without knowing it by 2050 or 2070. I think this is a very, very dangerous guess. So what we have to talk about is adaptation is key. And then we have to talk about uh, sufficiency 
and degrowth. I think part of the of the of the aim of the book is to show that these topics, which have been completely neglected by economists, should be taken more seriously. And all the expertise on climate change, which is so geared towards a technological solution. If you take the, the, the last report of the IPC Group 3, I, um, I made some uh, counting of words. Transition is like at every page. Uh, sufficiency is just appearing now. And it's a very small, still very small. It is their sixth report. It's been 30 years that they have studied uh, what we have to do uh, for climate change. And it is only now that they are talking, they are starting to talk about sufficiency. Mm-hmm. Last, last March, for the first time, there was an article using an integrated assessment, assessment models to uh, show what uh, economic stagnation or economic degrowth how it helps to reach, to decrease the, the, the CO2 emission. It was for Australia, which is a rich country, right? And uh, of course, it makes things easier. I'm, I'm not saying this is the solution because I don't think there is a solution, but it should be studied more properly, I think, and, and, and not be left to some uh, like uh, uh, marginal environmentalist, dangerous uh, eco-warriors. No, it should be what what the discussion is about is, you know, there will be CO2 in the economy by 2050 for sure. So where do we put it? You know, in which sector, in which country? Uh, I think that's really, that, that should be the center of the discussion with the increase of, uh, of, of clean electricity, of course. But yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it's, it's interesting. Um, you know, I have a colleague who talks, uh, you know, he probably has a bias towards degrowth, but he recognizes it's complete political unviability. So he talks about eventual sort of post growth. And he's, you know, someone who's in the, the peak, the peak oil, peak oil camp, um, again, going to going to arrive too late and, and probably be pretty, pretty horrific, based upon the sort of debts we've run up and the, the need for growth to be able to, uh, to finance those debts. Um, Okay, well, I think we'll leave it there for now. Um, again, absolutely fascinating book. I can't endorse it uh, more highly. Um, coming out, uh, unfortunately, in the English world, I, I read the French version, um, and then I discovered I can use Google Translate within um, uh, within Kindle. <laughs> I had to translate little paragraphs at a time. It was excruciating. But um, how long do we have to wait, uh, you know, those of us who are not journalists, to, to get this book? Penguin is going to publish it uh, in Britain uh, in October 24. And I think in the US, it's slightly later. It will be January 25, something like that. Yeah. What's, what's next for you? What, are you? what are you working on now? Basically, this idea of uh, symbiosis, I want to expand it on the human muscle and to, I mean, to talk more about agriculture uh, and to talk more about the modernization of the human, I mean, the human muscle energy. And look at all sorts of uh, technologies which are not, you know, central, but like the shovel, the spade, uh, the wheelbarrow, uh, some basic technology which were very important to understand the, for the 20th century. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. And of course, there's uh, all of the symbioses of, of uh, so-called renewables technologies. Uh, lots, lots to discover. Okay, well, thank you again for your time, Jean-Baptiste. Um, Wish you well and uh, wel- welcome to the Anglosphere. There's, uh, there's, I think, two or three YouTube videos of you presenting uh, to some faculties around Europe. Uh, but it is amazing how insulated you and your ideas are by, by that little linguistic barrier. So glad, glad you're, you're breaking through. Thank you very much, Chris. You're welcome.